Hey guys, this is Gray Sheep and Hedge Wizards with me, Apples and Dragons. And today, the topic is going to be the world of ice and fire. Well, I guess I should be I guess I should be more specific than that. It's going to be Aegon the Unworthy, the 4th, and Aemon the Dragon Knight, and Daenerys, Queen Daenerys, and Daeron the Second the Good. That's a lot of topic. Uh, this is my Song of Ice and Fire show, where I talk about a Song of Ice and Fire like a lunatic. Uh, Song of Ice and Fire by George R. R. Martin. It's a series of books in the fantasy genre. And if you have not read all of them, go away. I say it with love, though. The glass candles are lit, so that's how you know it's Great Sheep and Hedge Wizards. If they're not lit, then it's something else. I'm wearing red today for Targaryens, because that's what I'm going to be talking about. Let me get the book, and let's dive right in. Kablam! The World of Ice and Fire. This is the book I've had my nose in lately. I'm, too, I'm way too close. Let me back up. I've never actually read it all the way through. I just kind of use it as a reference book when I want to know more about some historical reference in the main series. I thought, well, that's inadequate. I need to understand this book and the histories and what the author is doing with it. So I began reading the Targaryen reign from the beginning, <laughs> which was funny how I got there because I wasn't intending to read it from the beginning. I just wanted to understand Aegon the Fourth more. And then I realized, well, in order to understand Aegon the Fourth completely, I need to understand the reign of his father, Viserys the Second, I think, the first. I don't know. Some Viserys. And then that wasn't enough. I needed to understand Baylor. So I just kept backtracking. I was like, I'm just reading this freaking book backwards. Let me start at the beginning <laughs> with Aegon the Conqueror and then go all the way through and see what I can figure out about it. Um, and I did figure some things out. Some some basic but important things about the world of and fire. This is a very big and elaborate puzzle. A puzzle of history, a, his, a history puzzle. And the reason that every time I read the reign of a king, I need to go back and read the one before it, is because the stuff that came before contextualizes the stuff that's happening now. Always, every part, every part of this book that's true. There's no self-contained part of it. It's all interconnected and like hyperlinked. And it actually has um, themes. Like this is the untold history of Westeros and the Game of Thrones. But it's not just a dry telling of history. It's um, It's got a story in it actually a chronological cohesive story with a theme or uh, probably multiple themes that maybe you could boil down to one um in a previous episode i think it was about the night of the laughing tree i said that a theme of aim in the dragon knight is that history is written and passed down uh, by and for those who survived and those whose interests survived. That wasn't what I actually said, but that's like an improved version of it that I've come up with after thinking about it. The interest part is really key. And to show you what kind of book this is, all I need is uh, the Targaryen lineage tree. Here, on page, oh god, it doesn't have a number, 312, it's at the back, yeah, 
show you, show you what it looks like a little bit. So, let me pull that up on the screen so I can draw on it like a child. That's good. All right, so this is the Targaryen lineage tree in paint. I've already, as you can see, I've already drawn on it a bit. <laughs> it's a big tree. There's a whole lot of characters on this. And uh, I only just recently began to be able to, like, name a king or hear the name of a king and know who it is vaguely. Be able to associate things with it. <laughs> Once you get to that, that level, you're like... In super fan territory I think anyway so the basic idea is that history is written by the victor or the long version history is written and passed down by and for those who survived and those whose interests survived <laughs> and so that's how the story that's how the book is written and that's how the uh, the main series is written actually whenever history is uh, referenced in it but this uh, World of Ice and Fire book is an in-world history book. Like this book exists in the in the story of the main series, um, and that's why you can see you've got like the author George R. R. Martin in the front. See by George R. R. Martin, and then there's like another author that says like by Maester Yandel. Like wait a minute. Who's that? And it tells you, Maester Yandel is, uh, he's a character in the story who supposedly wrote this story. Preface. It is said with truth that every building is constructed stone by stone, and the same may be said of knowledge, extracted and compiled by many learned, learned men, each of whom builds upon the works of those who preceded him. Yep. Peoples familiar and strange, and lands near and far. So Maester Yandel is a historian, and um, it's important to know when he lived, because that's going to tell us what kind of pressures he was under when he was writing it, and by extension, what kind of biases must be in the book, given that Maester Yandel is the kind of person who is not suicidal. <laughs> Because the Targaryen lineage is a monarchy. And the thing about a monarchy is that the monarch pretty much has all the power. And the thing about power is that when you have pretty much all of it, history is almost whatever you want it to be. Because anybody who says otherwise, you can just threaten them with your power. So that's the idea. That's what the rulers do. And it's really hard for modern people like us to um, fully fully grasp that and internalize it because we live in a time where we can pretty much say whatever we want and uh, we don't live in a monarchy. Most of us, unless we came from a, a communist country or including myself, don't really know what it's like to not be able to say the truth where truth is not uh, an ultimate defense. Where the wants and demands of the people above you take precedence over what the literal truth is in any given situation. It's a terrible way to live. I don't know about you, but I'm a fan of the truth. But that's the kind of world that everybody in the continent of Westeros lives in. And maybe in this whole uh, fictional planet. Probably better or worse in different places. And Westeros doesn't seem as bad as some of the other places. But yeah, basically the idea is that you're not allowed to criticize the king in ways that um, threaten his rule or to repeat narratives that threaten his rule. So I grab the Targaryen tree and I begin at Aegon the Conqueror, the, uh, the first Targaryen king of Westeros. Or the Seven Kingdoms, really. You know, 
they don't say the King of West Coast. I just say that because it's shorter. Let me zoom in here. Well, you can kind of see it. So Aegon the Conqueror is the first ruler. And the idea is I'm going to trace a line that traces the parts of the tree and rulers whose interests survived. And if you've read the reign of the Targaryens in the World of Ice and Fire, you'll notice that as we go through this line, the impression of each king that you came away with when you read it will be reflected by the line. You can already see it happening right here with the, uh, the first few kings. Because Aegon I, the conqueror, and then Aenus I was his successor, and then Magor I was his successor. But notice I didn't put a circle around Magor. Let me put one around Aegon real quick. Just to be thorough here. I didn't put a circle around Magor because his interests did not survive. Or in other words, his successor's claim to power is not dependent on his claim to power. It's dependent on Aenus's. And his successor was Jaehaerys I, the conciliator. So that's why when you read the Royal of Ice and Fire, Magor I is called the Cruel. <laughs> well, he comes off as a total tyrant. He's completely abusing his power and just asserting, reasserting the, the Targaryen power of dragons that uh, Aegon the Conqueror did. Because after Aegon died, it, it was all starting to fall apart. And the faith... Uh, it was getting crazy. The Faith were like climbing over the walls of the castle to assassinate the Targaryens. <laughs> and that moment is one of a small handful of moments in the story that is uh, simply chilling when you read it because you don't see it coming. It kind of creeps up on you. Like um, the situation in King's Landing getting out of hand and uh, for the Targaryens anyway. And the, the common people coming very close to taking back their continent from the Targaryen dynasty. Some of the other moments where you get that feeling. There's the reign of Magor the Cruel and the Faith are um, taking back the city. And there's the storming of the Dragon Pit. And there's the, uh, the Dornish resistance to Aegon the Conqueror's conquest where they defeat Rhaenys and her dragon look at me I'm getting off topic all right so yeah Magor the Cruel's interest didn't survive because Jairus's claim is not based in Magor's claim it's based in Anus's claim so the histories historians don't need to whitewash Magor they only need to whitewash Anus and Aegon the Conqueror in order to um, sort of prop up, defend, and support the claim of the current king, Jaehaerys I, the conciliator. And then Jaehaerys' successor, um, none of his kids become kings, which is kind of crazy. He had a lot of kids without the sand. His grandkid, Viserys I, becomes the next king. So let me continue this line here. So this is where the Dance of the Dragons begins. And Aegon the Second is the king for a hot minute. So it kind of goes this way. And then uh, down here. I hope I didn't mess that up. I just did. I did mess that up. I fixed it. 
So it does actually go to Aegon the Second for a bit. But his he isn't the one whose interest survived. It's the uh, Aegon the Third. Goes this way. The unlucky, the sad, depressed, emo guy. After all he went through. Do -do -do -do. I haven't uh, read Egg on the Second's histories yet. Um, well, I probably have, but I just don't remember. Because they're probably in the Dance of the Dragons. And I read that. <clears throat> but I'm betting that he doesn't come off well in the history books. And then after Aegon the Third, it goes, "Oh, this is where this is where we're going to focus today." If I get there, he had three daughters and two sons. It went to Daron the First, the Young Dragon. And then he got himself killed in Dorne. And then it went to Baylor the First, the Blessed. And he got himself killed. And neither one of them had kids. So the succession jumped back up to Aegon the Third's brother, Viserys the Second Targaryen. So, I guess during the reigns of Daron the First and Baylor the First, they would have needed a circle, and so would their father Aegon the Third. But now that it's gone to Viserys the Second, this line, this circle around Aegon the Third needs to go away. Oh boy, I'm just drawing a new circle. Well, you get the idea. And then after Viserys II, went to Aegon IV, the unworthy. While he was king, you can be sure that nobody was calling him the unworthy. At least not within his hearing or the hearing of his court. Then after he died, I went to Daron II, the good Targaryen. And he gets a circle because his interests survived. Aegon the Unworthy's interests did not survive because Daron is a bastard. But that's, uh, we'll get to that eventually. <laughs> You're probably thinking, wait a minute, no, no. That's just a rumor that Aegon the Fourth started. Oh, it's a rumor, but Aegon didn't start it. Then after Dayron the Good, it went to, well, I haven't read further than that, to be honest. I don't know these other ones very well. Aegon the Fifth, the Unlikely. But I know Eris. So he was king, but his interest didn't survive because there's another branch, the Robert Baratheon branch. Do, 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 do. I think Aegon the Unlikely gets a circle. His interest did to survive. Sort of. That's sort of what's interesting about Robert's Rebellion, is that after Robert took the throne, um, all of the Targaryen's interests died. <laughs> because it's no longer the Targaryen dynasty. It's the Baratheon dynasty. But it's weird, because it's also kind of the Targaryen dynasty. Because Robert claims a drop of Targaryen blood through uh, 
Rael at Targaryen, right here. So let's say that even though Rayella was not the king, the ruler, her interest survived because Robert's rule depends on her claim. And Robert, uh, his actually survives to the present day course and of course his sons each in their own individual rules but actually after Tommen takes the throne Joffrey's interests die so let me undo that line Let me do this right here. There we go. <laughs> There's a big gap in the middle because I don't know that much about these ones. I don't know what order they go in. Who is older, Aeros the first or Makar the first? I think Aeros was. Because Makar was Maester Eamon's daddy. Yeah. And it was Makar's son who became king instead of Eamon. So Makar had to be the second one. So his interests survived. And Eris's did not actually. Do, 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 do. I have a song stuck in my head. There. <laughs> Let me zoom out on this sucker. Boom. It's beautiful. So there's a map, a rough map of history is written by the victor. <laughs> Everybody with a circle has to be uh, a perfect, heroic, flawless saint of a king or a queen in Rain Reina's case, Rayella's case. Um, you could probably get more detailed with it because, for example, the interests of Neris survived because of the bastardy fiasco. All right, so she can get a circle because if Daron was a bastard, then the claims of everybody who came after him, whose claim is rooted in him, and his claim is threatened, and they can't allow that. And the reason Neris comes across as such a saint, a pious, kind, friendly saint in the histories, is because Daron was a bastard. Maester Yandel is one historian. He's a more contemporary historian. I think he wrote this during the reign of Robert. So Maester Yandel's down here. Let me actually type that in. Nice. That's where Yandel lives. Hey, and Yandel references Grandmaster Kaif. Grandmaster Kaif lived right here. Aegon V, the unlikely. And he was a Grandmaster, which is the, the top maester. Sort of like the historical version of Grandmaster Pycelle. He's going to be right there in the middle of the royal family and everything that's going on in the Red Keep. Let me clean this up a little. Uh, 
There it is. So that's the general idea of how the World of Ice and Fire is written and how the histories in the main series are written. And we can add more maesters to the picture, but that'll do for now. So I said in a previous episode that the histories of Aegon IV, the Unworthy, are uh, full of contradictions. There's tons of them. It's like nonstop. In the past few days, I've been watching History of Westeros' episodes called Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight, part one and part two. It's about five hours long, and their knowledge of the story is uh, incredible. It's encyclopedic. They go through the histories of Aemon the Dragon Knight. And the people at the History of Westeros are well grounded in the, the rules of the setting. And they pay special attention to the perspectives of the characters as individuals. And as they're going through Aemon the Dragon Knight, they're trying to make sense of some of the things in it, some of the contradictions that don't fit. And they're really good at it. Um, they come up with explanations for how the story as it is can make sense. And it's really important to flesh out the official narrative and to really uh, suss out the details of what it is exactly in any given situation that the historians are trying to get the reader to believe. Where the way the histories are written, not just the person reading it to fill in the gaps and to adopt and go along with, the opinions that are provided by the historian. And this starts right from the beginning of Aegon IV, his reign. Page 95. With his father's death in 172 AC, Aegon, the fourth of his name, came at last to the throne that he had coveted as a boy. So right away he tells me he coveted the throne. He had been comely in his youth, skilled with lance and sword, a man who loved to hunt and hawk and dance. He was the brightest prince at court in his generation, and was admired for his wit. And then I get exactly two sentences of very nice things to say about Aegon. And after those two sentences, for the rest of the entire reign of Aegon IV, which makes up one, two, three, four, five pages. And that's the end of the nice things to say about Aegon. It continues, but he had one great flaw. He could not rule himself. His lusts, his gluttony, his desires, they all controlled him utterly. Seated upon the Iron Throne, his misrule began with small acts of pleasure, but in time his appetites knew no bounds and his corruption led to acts that haunted the realm for generations. Anus was weak, and Magor was cruel, Kaith writes, and Aegon II was grasping, but no king before or after would practice so much willful misrule. <laughs> so that's the harshest criticism you could possibly imagine of anyone. By the end of the first paragraph of Aegon IV's reign, I'm told that what I should think about Aegon IV is that he was basically the devil incarnate, and he had no redeeming qualities. In fact, the redeeming qualities that he did have, he used them towards evil. It hasn't said that yet, but it implies them later on. So what you can do as you read this is that every time you read a sentence, you can ask yourself, is this sentence telling me something that happened? Or is it telling me what I should think? And when you do that, you find an alarming number of sentences that are just telling you what you should think. They haven't really told you anything that happened yet. And you also find an alarming number of sentences that do a mix of both. They're telling you something that happened, but in a way that also tells you what to think about it. One example I gave was a passage from Sansa. A Game of Thrones, Sansa 3. Arya was chewing at her lip in that disgusting way she had. Can we take Sirio back with us? Who cares about your stupid dancing master? Sansa flared. Father, I only just now remembered. I can't go away. 
I'm to marry Prince Joffrey. She tried to smile bravely for him. I love him, father. I truly, truly do. I love him as much as Queen Neris loved Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight, as much as John Quill loved Sir Florian. I want to be his queen and have his babies. Sweet one, her father said gently, listen to me. When you're old enough, I will make you a match with a high lord who is worthy of you, someone brave and gentle and strong. This match with Joffrey was a terrible mistake. That boy is no Prince Aemon. You must believe me. The Song of Ice and Fire story has in-story stories, and Aemon the Dragon Knight is one of them. Sansa is a character who really likes stories. She gets a lot of what she knows about the world from those stories. And in all accounts of the stories of Aemon the Dragon Knight, he was a shining example of chivalry, virtue, and heroism. Sansa acquired her impression of Aemon the Dragon Knight from those stories, so it's no wonder why she admires him and why she uses him as a stand-in for Joffrey when she's trying to persuade Ned not to send her away to Winterfell. At this stage of the story, we've already seen many times that Joffrey is a bad person. To name a few of them, we saw Joffrey being a jerk to the Starks at Winterfell, and he was cruel to Micah, the butcher's boy at the Trident, and he was uh, lying about the situation afterwards to King Robert. So even a first-time reader is going to be able to see that Sansa's judgment about Joffrey in this scene is clouded by her infatuation with him. Joffrey's tall, and he's about as handsome as Jamie, his biological father, and Cersei, and he's the crown prince to boot. So there's hardly a girl in the Seven Kingdoms who we shouldn't expect to fall head over heels in love with Joffrey, before having seen what kind of person he really is from a variety of interactions with him. So a reasonable summary of Sansa's paragraph is that Sansa is naive about Joffrey, where Sansa thinks Joffrey is a very good person, but the reader, like Ned, can see that the surprise life has in store for Sansa is that Joffrey is actually a very bad person. So the reader will come away feeling as though he's being mirrored by Ned, content that the story is aligning the thoughts of Ned Stark with his own thoughts. But in this passage, it might surprise you to learn that the reader is being symbolized by Sansa rather than Ned. Sansa's naivety about Joffrey's evilness is mirroring the reader's naivety about Aemon the Dragon Knight's evilness. The surprise that life has in store for Sansa will be the same as the surprise that the story has in store for the reader. This character you think is very good was actually very bad. And what happened was that over a course of a century, historians have misrepresented and lied about the people and events surrounding Aemon the Dragon Knight and his older brother Aegon IV the Unworthy and their younger sister Nerys, and most notably of all, Aegon the Unworthy's successor, Daron the Second the Good. And at first all of that's going to sound like the beginning of a grand conspiracy theory. But really no grand conspiracy needs to exist in order to explain it all. All we need in order to help us explain it all are these lines I just drew on the Targaryen lineage tree that show us which royal character's interests survived to the writing of each in-story history book. Maester Yandel wrote The World of Ice and Fire, and in this Aegon IV section, we'll see that Maester Yandel references Grand Maester Caith. And Grand Maester Caith wrote The Lives of Four Kings, um, characters reference the rumor that Daron II the Good was actually the son, the bastard son, of Aemon the Dragon Knight and Queen Neris. Let me read one of those passages. A Game of Thrones, John 8. John was shocked to see the shine of tears in the old man's eyes. Who are you? he asked quietly, almost in dread. A toothless smile quivered on the ancient lips. Only a maester of the Citadel, bound in service to Castle Black and the Night's Watch. In my order, we put aside our house names when we take our vows and don the collar. 
The old man touched the maester's chain that hung loosely around his thin, fleshless neck. My father was Makar, the first of his name, and my brother Aegon reigned after him in my stead. My grandfather named me for Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight, who was his uncle, or his father, depending on which tale you believe. Aemon, he called me. Aemon... Targaryen? John could scarcely believe it. Once, the old man said. Once. So you see, John, I do know. And knowing, I will not tell you stay or go. You must make that choice yourself, and live with it all the rest of your days. As I have. His voice fell to a whisper. As I have. So there it is. That's John learning that Maester Aemon was, is a Targaryen. Was, I guess, is more correct. So Maester Aemon talks about his grandfather. And Maester Aemon's grandfather was Daeron II the Good. The very same guy who were trying to figure out whether or not he was a bastard. And whose bastardy or legitimacy... The character of all of these histories surrounding Aegon IV, the Unworthy, depend upon. Other characters reference this rumor, too. Uh, I think uh, I think the old bear, Gior Mormont, references it. And so there are two viable explanations for why the rumor survived to the present day. One explanation is given in the histories. It's that Aegon IV, the Unworthy, began making up this rumor that Daeron is a bastard because he was a bad person. He was evil. And he was jealous of his brother Aemon the Dragon Knight for being better loved. And the other explanation for why the rumor survived is that it's the truth. And that's why people are still referencing it as a rumor rather than offering it up as the official narrative. Not that contemporary people live under the threat of a ruler whose claim is rooted in the legitimacy of Daron the Second the Good. The Baratheons are conquerors themselves, so their claims aren't actually rooted in any of the Targaryens' claims. But the Baratheon reign is pretty new. It's about 14 or 15 years old at the start of A Game of Thrones. So you can see how the habit of whispering this rumor behind closed doors uh, would linger after 300 years of about 300 years of Targaryen rule. And about 100 years of uh, Targaryen rule after Daeron II the Good. My knowledge of the story isn't quite encyclopedic just yet, but it seems to be slowly getting there. <laughs> so I'm going to continue reading. Aegon soon filled his court with men chosen not for their nobility, honesty, or wisdom but for their ability to amuse and flatter him. And the women of his court were largely those who did the same, letting him slake his lusts upon their bodies. On a whim, he often took from one noble house to give to another, as he did when he casually appropriated the great hills called the Teats from the Brackens and gifted them to the Blackwoods. For the sake of his desires, he gave away priceless treasures, as he did when he granted his hand, Lord Butterwell, a dragon's egg, in return for access to all three of his daughters. He deprived men of their rightful inheritance when he desired their wealth, as rumors claim he did following the death of Lord Plum upon his wedding day. That is a barrage of criticisms laid at the feet of Aegon IV. And because there are so many of them, it would be easy to continue without questioning any of them. And the first time you read this, that's probably what you do. That's certainly what I did. But I'm going to go through it again one sentence at a time and say some things about each one. Aegon soon filled his court with men chosen not for their nobility, honesty, or wisdom, but for their ability to amuse and flatter him. So I'm told that Aegon IV surrounded himself with um, people who are just going to tell him things he wants to hear and flatter him and um, give him what he wants. And, and there's nothing contradictory about that line. 
until you get to the part about the tournament. Let me skip ahead to it. I just remembered it's not even in this book. The tournament part is in uh, A Storm of Swords, Brand 2, The Night of the Laughing Tree Story. Let me get that. It says, uh, this is page 282. Brand nodded sagely. Mystery knights would often appear at tourneys, with helms concealing their faces, and shields that were either blank or bore some strange device. Sometimes they were famous champions in disguise. The dragon knight once won a tourney as the Knight of Tears, so he could name his sister the Queen of Love and Beauty, in place of the king's mistress. And Barrison the Bold twice donned a mystery knight's armor. The first time when he was only ten. It was the little Cranog man, I bet. So there it is. The Dragon Knight once won a tourney as the Knight of Tears, so he could name his sister the Queen of Love and Beauty, in place of the King's Mistress. So apparently, there was a tournament, and um, Aegon the Unworthy had a plan to humiliate or insult his wife, Queen Nerys, publicly by naming his mistress the Queen of Love and Beauty instead of his queen. And then Aemon the Dragon Knight somehow caught wind of this plan and um, decided to don a, a disguise and become the Mystery Knight, the Knight of Tears, and win the tournament and then crown his sister, Queen Nerys, the Queen of Love and Beauty so that Aegon couldn't crown his uh, his mistress. So the ways that these two passages might be in conflict is that if Aegon IV was planning to humiliate his wife, Queen Nerys, at the tournament by naming his mistress the Queen of Love and Beauty instead of her, then it would be at least a little weird if Aegon told anybody about that plan before executing it. How could telling Aemon, or anybody for that matter, um, do anything but sabotage his plan? his own plan. So the official telling of this part of history is that Aegon told somebody about his plan, apparently for no reason. Because how else would Aemon have learned about it? And if Aegon did tell somebody about his plan, if Aegon really did surround himself with ambitious uh, lick spittles who just wanted to amuse and flatter him, then why would they give away Aegon's evil plan? It's possible, but on the face of things, it just doesn't make sense. And we're going to see that that's the case with all kinds of situations throughout these parts of history, where we're given an explanation of a situation that demands the existence of a complex and extreme and often contradictory sort of evilness in Aegon IV where a simpler face value explanation is still viable and has gone ignored or overlooked. This is from the reign of Viserys II, Aegon IV's dad. Viserys II had within him the capacity to be a new conciliator, for no king had ever been shrewder or more capable. Tragically, a sudden illness carried him away in 172 AC. It need not be said that some found the illness and its swiftness suspicious, but none dare to speak their suspicion at the time. It would be more than a decade before the first accusation was put to paper that Viserys had been poisoned by none other than his successor, his son Aegon. Is there truth to this suspicion? We cannot say for certain, but given all the infamous and corrupt deeds of Aegon the Unworthy, both before and after he assumed the crown. It cannot be discounted. <laughs> Is Aegon the Unworthy guilty of this crime? I don't know. But he's guilty of all these other crimes I said he's guilty of, so he must be guilty of this one. And there's no need to distinguish one crime from the other, especially not for this guy. <laughs> I haven't worked out what's really going on with 
that situation. Viserys' death yet. But I suspect that it was actually Aemon or people he was working with who killed him. My first instinct is that it was what it seemed to be. It was a sudden illness that carried him away. But that wouldn't be as cool as actually it was Aemon the Dragon Knight and the Martells or whoever. A lot of the situations I haven't figured out yet. I've only just started putting these pieces together. When he casually appropriated the great hills called the Teats from the Brackens and gifted them to the Blackwoods. Or when he gave uh, his hand Lord Butterwell a dragon's egg. That one's pretty cool. Mary Meg is the example that leaps to mind. So one of Aegon the Worthy's mistresses was a woman named Maggot, or Mary Meg, became her nickname. It says, the young and buxom wife of a blacksmith. While riding near Fair Market in 155, Aegon's horse threw a shoe, and when he sought out the local smith, he came to notice the man's young wife. He went on to buy her for seven gold dragons, and the threat of Sir Joffrey Staunton of the King's Guard. Megget was installed in a house in King's Landing. She and Aegon were even wed in a secret ceremony, conducted by a mummer, playing a septon. Megget gave her prince four children in as many years. Prince Viserys put an end to it, returning Megget to her husband and placing the daughters with the faith to be trained as septas. Megget was beaten to death within a year by the blacksmith. Holy shit, right? So what's interesting is that um, perhaps the premier villainy of Aegon IV is his mistresses. There's two pages dedicated to his uh, noble mistresses. Ugh. One day I'll learn how the camera works. And they're referenced often throughout the whole thing. Some of them playing a part in other dramas, like one we just went over about the, the teats. The hills between House Bracken and House Blackwood. It's like, okay, well, two of those mistresses were Brackens and one of them was a Blackwood. I think. Let me see. Yeah. Lady Barbara Bracken, Lady Bethany Bracken, and Lady Melissa Missy Blackwood. So anyway, the story of Mary Meg as told here is that Aegon was riding near Fair Market. His horse threw a shoe and he sought the local smith and he noticed the man's young wife. So it could be interpreted as though Aegon is the kind of guy who's just going to snatch up any woman he wants when he sees her, even if she's married, he doesn't care. He's going to send his king's guard, Sir Joffrey Staunton, to threaten the man and uh, take her anyway, if the gold isn't enough to do the trick. And then they were wed in a secret ceremony conducted by a mummer playing a septon. <laughs> so the scene that this mummer wedding leads us to imagine is that Megat being married already, she had an objection to uh, having sex with Aegon. And Aegon, being the single-minded horn dog that he supposedly is, did a, did a Las Vegas wedding. <laughs> he was like, all right, we'll, we'll get wed right here. Then he went out and found a mummer and said, hey, I need you to pretend to be a septon so you can fool this idiot woman into thinking that she married me and then I can have sex with her. <laughs> and so that suggestion is um, it isn't textual that whole scene and Aegon's villainy in it is delivered to the reader through entirely through suggestion so the history as it's written retains its plausible deniability that it didn't technically lie about anything at all if Aegon was actually the hero of the situation I'm sure every sentence in it is still technically true. Just in a superficial kind of way that does a lot of work to convey a falsehood about what actually really happened. 
<laughs> in this situation with Mary Meg. Then it says, Prince Viserys put an end to it, returning Megat to her husband and placing the daughters with the faith to be trained as septas. As written, Aegon's dad saw what kind of hijinks Aegon was up to and decided this is unacceptable behavior for a prince. I'm going to put a stop to it and separate the two. I'm going to send the daughters to be septas because that's a noble calling and the faith always needs more septas. I'm going to send Megat back to her husband because uh, one marriage doesn't overwrite the other one. And I'm going to order Aegon to never go back and see her again and to leave the blacksmith alone. That part's not in here, but seems like a reasonable thing that Ceres would have done in combination with these other things that it says he did. And then it says Meg was beaten to death within a year by the blacksmith. And that line, like every line before it, is loaded with suggestions. As written, it seemed like what happened was that the blacksmith didn't like that his wife was uh, impregnated or even uh, sullied or whatever by another man. And he was so infuriated about it, and so he killed her. And that's Aegon's fault, because he shouldn't have taken her away from the blacksmith to begin with. <laughs> and now this is where the truth of the situation begins to peek through the subtext. So here are all the exact same facts of the story of Mary Meg, but told in a different way. In the case that Daron II, the good, is a bastard, since these histories must be written so that Daeron seems like the legitimate son of King Aegon and Neris, once upon a time there was a blacksmith and his wife. One day the king was riding nearby and his horse threw a shoe. When the king came to the blacksmith's shop to get the shoe re replaced, he saw the blacksmith hit his wife. The king was outraged, but there was nothing he could do about it because the woman was married and a wife belongs to her husband. Having an idea for how to save the woman from the blacksmith, the king made the blacksmith an offer he couldn't refuse. He offered him no less than seven gold dragons, seven times the price that Rosie's maiden head commands in Old Town from Pate the Pig Boy. But the blacksmith was so cruel that he refused the king's offer, preferring instead to have a woman around who he can hit. I just realized I screwed up the story because Aegon isn't actually the king yet. Then Aegon had the king's guard, Sir Joffrey Staunton, threaten the blacksmith, and the blacksmith, now backed up against the threat of violence, had no choice but to give up his wife to Aegon. And then Aegon installed Megat in a house in King's Landing, where Aegon wanted to marry her, but he couldn't really marry her because she was already married, and there was no way the blacksmith was going to... Uh, have the marriage annulled, and marriage annulments actually don't really happen in this setting, except in extreme cases. Aegon went out and found a mummer to do a sort of honorary wedding of sorts, because he came to love Maggot, wanted to live with her, and that's what they did for a while. They had four beautiful girls, Alisanne, Lily, Willow, and Rosie. And then Aegon's dad found out about it, and he's the prince, and he disapproved, so he made Aegon give Megat back to the blacksmith. And when the blacksmith finally got his wife back, thanks to Viserys, he continued beating her, this time worse than before. And within a year, Megat was beaten to death. Who's the asshole in that story? Viserys the second, that's who. And the hero is Aegon the fourth. Anyway, I've barely even scratched the surface, but I'm gonna have to continue it next time. Let's see, which one's Mary Meg? That's her in the middle. I'll show you Mary Meg. Mm.
All right, guys. I'm out of here. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.